Everyone assumes that doctors have terrible working hours. I mean, can you imagine going early, staying late, overnight, weekends, all of that. But is it necessarily true for doctors all over the world? <laughs> Let's talk about the working hours of doctors in the NHS. If this is the first time you're checking out our channel, welcome. Basically what we do is we run a website that's totally free known as roadtouk.com and it will explain the ins and outs about everything related to the United Kingdom and what it takes for you to work as a doctor in the NHS. So if you've not already, please stalk us on all of our social media. Find us on Facebook, find us on Twitter, Instagram, and of course YouTube. Don't forget to subscribe. Hey guys, my name is Debreeze and I currently work as a doctor in the UK. And in today's video, we're going to be talking about all that kind of stuff. What does your work schedule look like? What are the hours that you have to work? Do they make you work crazy hours? What about things like leave, holidays, time off, study leave, etc, etc. What if you want to work less than full time? Let's get into it. So what are the working hours for doctors in the NHS? Now, of course, there's going to be some variation, hospital to hospital, specialty to specialty, but basically when you're understanding it, what we're going to be talking about are your normal working hours, your normal working day, what are on-call shifts, evening shifts, the variety of types of evening shifts, and night shifts, weekend shifts, etc. So basically, when you think of a normal working day, that's your 9 to 5 or 8 to 4, depending on what works as a normal working day in your department. It may even be 8 to 6. Less acute specialties pretty much only have two sets of hours to take into consideration. You have your normal working day and your on-call shifts. And then more acute specialties will have a variety of shifts, which we'll get into in a second. But let's first talk about the most important part of all of this, your work time regulations. What that means is how much work can you be expected to do and how much time off do you get for all that work that you're putting in. First of all, your working week cannot average more than 48 hours. What that means is in a week, yes, there might be some weeks you're working more than 48 hours. There might be some weeks that you're working less than 48 hours, but the average of that time cannot be more than 48. And that is a really important thing, especially when you think about how you may have been working back home, the amount of hours you've been putting in. This is a luxury in comparison. You must have a day off each week, at least one day, uh, more often than not, in a lot of specialities, yeah, you get your weekends off. You don't have to worry anything about like the golden weekend like they do back in the States or anything like that. And there are other ways that you can get this time off we'll talk about in a sec. But remember, you must have a day off each week. You need 11 hours of rest in a 24 hour period. Now, what does that mean? When you're thinking about your shift, if you finish at 10 p.m., all right, you cannot, when you think about, all right, what's 11 hours after that? So you've got 11 p.m., 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 9 o'clock. If you're expected to be in at work at 8 o'clock the next morning, you cannot. You have to say, actually, since I finished last night at 10 p.m., I cannot be expected to come in before 9 a.m. because that is 11 hours, and I need to have 11 hours rest in between those two shifts. So remember that. Pay attention to your rota. Know exactly what's expected of you. You need to have a break in the working day if it's longer than six hours. And taking breaks is really important. I've, I've talked about this in so many articles that we've written about taking your breaks and knowing when you should be having a break. Ideally, you know, at about four to five hours, we do usually take a break. Even if it's just sitting there quietly having a cup of tea or doing absolutely nothing, take your breaks, get away from the clinical scene and just have your time. You have a right to have four weeks of paid leave per year. Now, the amount of time that you get off for leave increases as you get older, I suppose, in the NHS. But basically, you start off at the four weeks. And of course, those times that you have off aren't taking into consideration your weekend. So if you're already not working a weekend, that's fine. You can add that on to the leave that you have. It's not that they are counting your weekends as well as leave. You must not get more than four night shifts in a week. Okay, and then you have to have 46 hours of rest in between the third or fourth set of nights. So how that usually works is if you're working weekend nights, so you've got Friday night, Saturday night, um, Sunday night, and then basically you finish Monday morning, you do not go back to work until Thursday. Okay, so Monday, obviously, yes, you were technically working on Monday, you go home, you get some rest, you get rest on Tuesday, you get rest on Wednesday, you're back to work on Thursday. 
for the weekdays, if you're thinking about how will that work, it will be like you're on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday nights. You finish Friday morning, and obviously that's considered a working day. Then you have Saturday, Sunday off, you're back on Monday. And that is making sure that you have those days of rest in between your night shifts. Your shift cannot last more than 13 hours. This is really, really important. We get a lot of people who message us and be like, you know, oh, will they tell me I have to come in extra early or will they not tell me it but expect me that even though it says I'm working from nine to five, I should be there at seven or I should be going home late at night. No, guys, whatever your rostered working time is, that's when you come, that's when you leave. You do not work more than your maximum. If you do, we'll talk about in a second what you're supposed to do in those situations, but you should not be an, under any obligation or expectation to be working longer than what you are rostered to work. Now, let's break it down and look at some of our work schedules from different departments in the past, just so you can get an idea. Of course, remember guys, these are just examples. Each hospital will have a different setup and the way it's laid out may not be the same for your hospital, but it's just for you to get an understanding of what your shift pattern could look like in these departments. So, so if you're looking at the work schedule for emergency medicine, you see that our normal working days were eight to five. Where it says zero to zero, those were our days off. And then we had evening or twilight shifts, which started at three and finished at midnight. And then we had night shifts, which were from 10, 15 to 8.30 in the morning. And we had other earlier evening shifts, which started at two till midnight. And then you'll even see we had some shifts that went from 5 p.m. to 1 a.m. And that was the variety of which our hospital at that time was running the emergency department. You'll see that on the side it says week one, week two, week three, et cetera, et cetera. What that means is that's how many weeks they would have in each rota schedule. Once you had this, you knew that after week eight, you would start at week one all over again. So really, if I was working the schedule, my first and my eighth week would be the only days that I would have normal working days. Otherwise, I was working these unsocial on-call hours for the evening times or for night shifts. And you can see that they were making sure there were time off in between um, that I was getting days off after working particular patterns. So I was well rested before I was expected to come on to my next shift. For acute medicine, it's still a fairly acute speciality, so you'll see a lot of unsocially hours, but it's still, in my opinion, a little bit better than ED. And this is what we were looking at here. You can see here for the working arrangement, it's 17 weeks. Again, it depends on your hospital and how much staff they have to work with and how they make the rota. But what you're basically looking at, we had twilight shifts, which were from three till midnight. We had night shifts from 9.30 in the evening till the next morning. We had the normal working day was from 8 to 5.15 and we had full shifts or long days for on-call from 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. And you would have either weekend shifts or we would have weekday shifts. You'll see occasionally they have 10 to 7. When we worked in acute medicine in our hospital, their 10 to 7 shifts were clinics with uh, what they call ambulatory care, patients who were coming in acutely but necessarily didn't need to be admitted. We could see them and then send them on their way or they were just coming in for a scan or certain tests. And that was our roster pattern at that time where there are nothing where it's like an empty cell. Those were our days off. And that's how we, again, spent the time out to recuperate, recover, and then come back into the hospital. For medical specialties, of course, guys, again, this can vary, um, but just a general idea of what a medical specialty kind of rota would potentially look like. Um, again, this is a 17 week one. You see that for our medical specialties, we were working from nine to five. That was the normal working day. And then we have night shifts in between and we have some long days. For medicine, and depending on your hospital, it could be that on your long days, what you're expected to do is be on your medicine ward or whatever medicine speciality you are for the nine to five. And in the evening do either cover, you're covering the wards or you do a take, which is the admissions. And for the weekends, it could be the entire day you are doing a cover shift covering the wards or you're doing a take or admissions day the entire day. This can really depend, but those are the just general hours. You're seeing that there from 9 to 10 p.m. or 9 to 5 for your normal working day. You'll notice there are no twilight or other awkwardly unsocial hours because that's how medicine works. It's not as acute as acute medicine or emergency medicine. But this is just your basic understanding. I know you might be like, well, what about surgery? What about peds? What about ICU? Yeah. 
it's pretty much the same thing guys the reason we chose these specifically is that they pretty much covered all of the main things like even when we were in icu icus was fairly close to what medicine was in the sense that we had the normal working day from eight to six and then we just had either a full shift or a night shift and that's pretty much how it is in medicine as well there might be some varieties in different hospitals of what you would be doing at those different times but the general thing that you have to understand from these is the pattern what are your shift patterns and the time that you're getting off in between that you might be wondering, all right, fine, you're telling me I'm supposed to be leaving at five o'clock. How can I make sure I am leaving at the times that I need to be leaving? And the best way to make sure you are doing that is the effective handover, the SBAR, telling people exactly what they need to know about what's happening so that you can go home. Because when you finish at five, remember somebody else is continuing on their work. Either they're doing the cover or they're doing the take and you need to let them know about the patients. So how can you do that? With the S bar, you let them know what is going on. Why are you telling them about this patient? Why is it really important that they need to know about what's happening with this individual? What's, you know, what's the issue with them? What's the background? What do they come in with? What are they generally unwell with? When you saw them, what was the problem? What are your considerations for what needs to be done? And then your recommendations at the very end, I think maybe this patient may need a review in a couple of hours, or they may need a repeat of these bloods, or I might want you to look at this or look at that. The important thing about the S bar is you do not hand over every single patient that you've seen that day or that is under your ward or anything like that. The reason for the S bar is you need to highlight these patients that I'm really worried about this person or that person, or I think there's something that needs to be done for this individual or that individual, or I was trying to tie up a plan that was I was doing during the daytime, but unfortunately I've not been able to get through all of it. So here's what I want done for the evening, if possible. Sometimes with how your hospital will work, it could be that you come down at you know, five or 5.15 to a certain area and that's where everyone hands over to each other and you let the medical registrars or the surgical registrars or whoever the registrar is and let them know that these are the patients that you're concerned about or these are the patients that need an extra looking into and that's what you should be telling them at that time. On night shifts, the acute care team, if your hospital has them, who are part of the hospital at night team to make sure that they're also reviewing ill patients, may need to know about these individuals, especially if there's someone who might be potentially for ICU, because if they become very unwell overnight, you need to know what their treatment escalation plan is and what you need to do for them next. I know it may seem like I'm saying a lot of things at once, but the reason that the handover is so important is no one will actually know that much about the patient except for you because you've been looking after them the entire day so if you can give these salient features these top points to this individual when you're handing over to them it makes their job easier and it makes your job easier so you can go home now exception reporting remember when i said sometimes you maybe won't be able to go home on time and it's not something that's always in your control if you're a doctor working in england all right and you're working longer than your roster to work you're not being able to take a break. You're missing actual opportunities for teaching and learning. You are very understaffed on the ward or you feel that you are not being supported. You will put in an exception report and these are really important. If anyone is telling you, you should not be putting in an exception report. You need to speak with your hospital's guardian of safe working hour, your freedom to speak up guardian, and whoever you have there as a BMA representative or whatever kind of union representative, because exception reports are extremely important. It's what protects you. If you're there longer than you should be, people might be asking, what are you still doing here? Why aren't you going home on time? And you need to say, I haven't been able to go home on time because we've not had enough staff or there's too many things going on and I'm not supported enough. I need a registrar to help me. Or just the simple fact that there's something else that's affecting the amount of work that you're able to get done and you need to know what's happening. If it's an exception report for you working longer than what you need to be working, you will get either that time back in lieu. So you'll get, you know, if you worked an hour extra, you'll get an hour back or you'll get that back as a payment. If it's more serious things about you are unable to do things because of how understaffed you are, these get flagged up and they know that they need to make sure they're hiring individuals to help fill in these gaps. So exception reporting is extremely, extremely important. Please do not think you're putting anyone off by exception reporting. And like I said, if someone is telling you you should not be exception reporting, you need to raise it because it's not acceptable for them to tell you that you cannot be exception reporting. Now, moving on to less than full time work, a lot of individuals have con contacted us and said, I, I can't work the full hours. You know, I've got a family to look after, other obligations to take into consideration. That's fine. You can opt for less than full time work. There are two types that they usually have out there called slot share or job share. Slot share is where there is a post or more than one post that is shared between doctors in a way that everyone's duties fill out like a full-time doctor would. 
There may be some general overlap, but basically you have separate educational opportunities. And if you're doing a job share, there's like a 50-50 split. So you're sharing the job with somebody else. Um, but the pay, educational opportunities, all that stuff is also split in that way. So now you might be asking, well, fine, I'm on a visa. How can I do less than full time? Speak to UQVI, speak to your deanery if you're doing it as a trainee or speak to your HR department if you're doing it as a non-trainee and see what the workarounds are. But we know a lot of people on visas who are doing less than full time and it's not an issue. It's just something if you're looking to do this that you need to talk about early on so that they know that's what you want and that's what your intention is. Now, let's get into the types of leave. This is the most important thing, what you are going to be doing when you don't need to be in the hospital. First and foremost, annual leave. These are your vacation days. This is your holiday. Whatever you do on annual leave is up to you. If you want to do some extra locum work on your annual leave, by all means. If you want to sit at home and do absolutely nothing, more power to you. If you want to go on vacation and you know tour the world, yeah, go ahead. So basically, if you're a junior doctor on the 2016 contract, you're getting 27 days of annual leave per year. And depending on how your roster and rotations are set up, if you're split up into, let's say, four months, four months, four months rotations, you're basically getting nine days in each rotation. And like I said before, guys, you can pair that up with your weekends. So if you're already off on Saturday and Sunday and then you've put annual leave from Monday to Friday, that's only five days of annual leave that you've booked. And then you've got that next weekend as well. So it's not that your weekends are going to be counted into your annual leave. OK, those weekends are separate because you're already off on those days. Consultants basically can go up to about like six weeks of annual leave. And then, of course, um, you can get additional days depending on what, what your contract is and where you're working in the UK. But like I said, annual leave is there. Study leave. Study leave is for you to use when you want to attend a seminar or a conference or some sort of teaching and gain some knowledge. Um, you can even use it when you're taking any postgraduate exam. You'll need to speak with your Rota office, your postgrad center, depending on what kind of study leave it is, at least four to six weeks in advance. Um, and you might even need some verification done by your postgrad center to say, is this something that you need right now? If there's a study budget in your hospital, use your study budget so you're not paying for everything out of pocket and go for it. Go and get your study leave and learn. Maternity leave and paternity leave. Okay, this is a pretty loaded section of, of today's video, which we can probably spend another two videos talking about. But the important thing for you to take away from this is there is paternity leave in the UK and there is maternity leave in the UK. Everyone has the right to take maternity leave, whether it's paid or unpaid. Now, for your particular situation, because everyone's situation is different, I would highly recommend you reach out to your union and you talk to them about what situation works best for you because there is standard maternity leave and then there's maternity leave under the NHS. And the amount that you get paid and the duration you get paid can really vary. There's even shared parental leave, if that's something that you're kind of looking into. So like I said, if you're planning on this, plan ahead of time, speak to your union and make it work. Um, paternity leave, though, in general, is just two weeks and mat leave can be up to a year. That full year, though, isn't always paid. So you would have to look into what you would be doing in between and if that's something that you would be happy to do. But like I said, it's something that is your right but you need to plan well for it. Sick leave, of course we all get sick. Don't act like you don't get sick or don't come into work if you're feeling unwell. So you've got to let your road coordinator know in your department as soon as you know you're gonna be unwell. You can self-certify and say that I'm unwell for up to seven days. Anything longer than that, you're gonna need a note from your GP. If you're taking sick leave for any certain thing that's happened, maybe you've had an operation or you're just unwell from something else, you would need to get a note that covers that time. If you're a trainee, I know you might be really concerned because what if it affects your training, but you have to declare it at the very end of your training right before your ARCP. And if they are happy with all the other considerations of your training that you've managed to you know, keep up with, there shouldn't be any reason for you to be concerned about an extension. But still, make sure whenever you're doing this that you're going about it the right way. And for sick leave that you know that you can mention in advance, for instance, if you know you're going to have an operation at a particular date, ask and request it as soon as possible so that you can make sure there's not any gaps in the rota. Okay, compassionate leave. It's basically bereavement leave. So this is when something unfortunate has happened and you've had a death in the family. It's, it's paid leave. Um, and you need to speak to your rota office as well about this and how soon you can have it and how long you can have it for. Basically, if you don't ask, you won't know. So don't think that, you know, if something terrible does happen in your family that you're left high and dry because who do you talk to or what do you need to do? Again, you can always speak to your union if you have any concerns. 
Finally, professional leave. When you go for interviews, you're probably like, well, why would they let me go for an interview when I'm working for them? But especially for something like a training interview. So you're working as a non-trainee doctor and you've got your CST interviews coming up and you're like, oh, I need to take a day off because it's like at the opposite end of the country. I need to go and prepare. You can take professional leave for this. You need to speak to your rotor coordinators, of course, as soon as possible to arrange for it, but it is possible. We've taken it when we applied for internal medicine training for our interviews. And I highly recommend you utilize that day because you want to be fully prepared for your interview. You don't want to leave anything up and out in the middle of nowhere. And finally, loo days. Lou days are like the golden ticket in the NHS. All right, what they basically mean are, like I said before, if you ever have an exception report that you put in because you're working too many hours or you've worked a little bit extra and they give you a day back, that's the time back in lieu, you can get lieu days for a lot of things. Let me explain. So let's say for instance that it's Saturday and you're not working that Saturday, but you really wanna to go to this conference and you're like, I wanna book it. So you book the study leave, you book it on your day off, but guess what? It's considered a working day because you're attending this conference. So you will get another day back in lieu, which basically means they'll give you that day back. They'll say, oh yes, that day you should have been off, but since you weren't, since you went and attended something else, we'll give you a day and you can put it where you wanna put it. The same way if you're working a bank holiday, you get a day back in lieu. So if everyone else gets a three day weekend and you're like, I cannot believe I'm working on Monday when it's a bank holiday and everyone else is getting that day off, you're getting that day back in lieu that you can put forth to any other time. What I like to do sometimes if I can get in contact with the rotor coordinators early enough, if I know that I need a little extra time for a vacation, I will ask them if I can work all the bank holidays so I can rack up some loo days and put it together with my annual leave and then you're pretty much set. You can add more days to your vacation if you can really strategically plan it to the days after you're done with nights, so the days that you're already off, with weekends, and then of course with any loo days, utilizing the rest of your annual leave, you can put away a good amount of time if you actually look and plan into it. But of course that's being proactive. And if it's not possible with loo days, there are still, like I said, the weekends or days after you have nights or any other on-call shifts that you're getting off that you can put to your best ability. And that is the long and the short of it, guys. If you have any further questions, of course you know you can comment below and we will get back to you. In the description box, we've linked a lot of articles and other things that we think will be really useful for you to look at and utilize for you to understand better how the working hours are. At the end of the day, what should you be taking away from all of this? What you should be taking away is no, you will not be expected to do crazy hours. You are not gonna do 100 hour weeks. No one should be telling you to be working longer than you need to be working. If you're nine to five, you're nine to five. You're not seven to seven just because you need to show someone you're being extra extra. No, there's nothing like that in the NHS. So. Do your due diligence, work the times you're supposed to be working, get your rota checked if you work in England through a union to see that you're working the right types of rota hours and that you're doing things the way you're supposed to be doing. And when in doubt, ask, speak to a freedom to speak up guardian, speak to a guardian of safe working hours, speak to your union. Is this the way that things should be done? If you're not happy, there's no reason for you not to ask because you'll never know until you ask. And, and until next time, please subscribe to us on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Follow us, be awesome, comment, subscribe, check out our newsletter, and we'll see you soon. Bye.